Hi, my name is Jackie, and I want to welcome you back to my channel, Heart and Apron. Today, I have a Thanksgiving special to share with you. I know that this year, Thanksgiving is going to look so different for so many of us. Due to COVID, our tables might not be as full, whether or not it's from the loss of a loved one or because to keep our loved ones safe, we have to stay separate. So I wanted to come up with some fun ideas to help make your Thanksgiving still feel a little special while not maybe having to break the bank with a giant turkey that might still be in your freezer the year later if you are like my family. And so in this episode, I'm gonna start out by sharing two kid-friendly appetizers. And I'm also going to share with you two yummy meal ideas that make it feel gourmet, but they're not something that is going to leave you with just piles and piles of leftovers. I don't really appreciate that. I'm good with turkey for a couple days and then I'm, I'm done. So I, maybe I'm the only one around like that, but I thought that you guys might enjoy seeing some new things. So I'm going to be sharing my fig balsamic pork tenderloin with Parmesan risotto and asparagus, as well as a really versatile chicken recipe where you can either have a cheesy herb crusted chicken or you can have a jalapeno popper chicken. It kind of makes it really nice if you have a small family and maybe you and your husband want something a little spicy, but your kids say no. Anyways, I also have a really fun announcement that I will be making at the end. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope that you will stick around and let's get cooking. For today's first recipe, we are just going to be making a really easy appetizer or dessert. And basically it's just a, a caramel apple turkey. We are going to be filling this small bowl up with caramel sauce and I'm going to cut up these apples and place them all around the bowl um, in kind of a fanned out fashion, kind of like turkey feathers would be, and take some of the pieces to make a little face inside the caramel. And basically, it just makes an instant, really adorable appetizer that I am sure is going to bring a smile to your loved one's faces. So I thought it would be a little bit of fun to just share a little bit of folklore and random facts throughout this episode that I looked up and if, as you get to know me you'll find I'm always looking for an opportunity to learn something else and to just kind of get to delve into history and find out new facts. So I'm using this as an opportunity to share some of the fun things that I've learned. Did you know that Thanksgiving was first celebrated in 1621 in a three-day harvest festival between the settlers and the Wampanoag? So the Wampanoag means the people of first light, and they've actually been living in North America, or as they call it, Turtle Island, for over 15,000 years. Isn't that so cool? Unfortunately, the people of the light are still fighting to be heard and for their homeland today. If you'd like to learn more about it, I found a really awesome Time Magazine article that is down below and I encourage you to check it out. So this appetizer is really more of a craft than a recipe. It's all about the presentation, right? So I'm going to use three brown paper bags and I'm going to basically make a brown paper turkey and stuff it with popcorn. And it just makes it a fun little appetizer for kids or for adults to just have an extra snack while maybe you're waiting for the food to finish up. So I'm going to take two of the bags and I'm going to turn them into little legs. And I have these white strips of paper that I am going to basically just kind of lightly trim along the edges to create that bone look. And after I formed my two turkey legs, and I'm sorry, I tried to get as much on screen as possible, but I kind of messed that up. I am going to make some popcorn, stuff this bag up, fold it up, and use a stapler to kind of close it all up together. And I instantly have a really adorable paper bag turkey. Where do we get the cornucopia? And why is it shaped that way? I know it's a common image in American Thanksgiving, but I wanted to know where it came from. And so several years ago, my daughter and I put out and hunt and decided to find out where. So it turns out that it actually has its origins far before America ever began and goes back to Greek mythology. So let's talk folklore and legend for a minute. When Zeus was born, his power jealous father Cronus intended to have him killed. So his mother Rhea stole him away to the Isle of Crete where he was cared for by a magical goat named Amalthea. 
The story goes that one day as Zeus fed from Amalthea, he accidentally broke off one of her horns with his magical strength. There are different depictions on how the horn began to change and why, but one way or another, the horn is said to have put forth a never-ending supply of food and nourishment from that day forward, creating what is known as the Horn of Plenty, or what we know today as the Cornucopia. After this, the horn became a symbol of many Greek and Roman gods. My favorite is Abundachia, or Fortuna, as she is other known, otherwise known. The, this abundance and prosperity goddess is said to carry the Horn of Plenty filled with grain and coin that she would blindly spill upon the people. Now I get to show you how I make my fig balsamic pork tenderloin with Parmesan risotto and asparagus. I'm not gonna lie. This is one of the recipes that I was most excited to share with you. So we're gonna start out with the Parmesan risotto. Now on the side, I need you to prepare four cups of chicken broth and just set it aside. You don't see me do this on film, but it is incredibly important to the process. After that, I need you to finely dice one shallot, which we are going to saute in a pan with one tablespoon of butter and one tablespoon of minced garlic. Now once that's all together, we're gonna to saute that for about three to four minutes, and then I'm going to add one cup of or borio rice, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, let it cook with the garlic and shallots for about another three to four minutes or until you start to see that rice slightly golden. Now it's time to add the broth, but we're gonna do it slowly because that's part of what makes the risotto magic. So we're gonna add half a cup of broth at a time to the rice. And we're gonna make sure to stir it really often and kind of let it go until it, the broth is mostly gone and then you add another half cup of broth and so on and so on until you've used up all the broth. By the time that that's done, the rice should be creamy and tender and I just add a little bit of parsley and salt to taste and top it with one to two handfuls of Parmesan cheese, mix it together and it's done. Now. Risotto always has the bad rap of being really hard to make. It's not hard to make. It just takes a little bit of time and dedication, but if you're willing to put it forward, it's absolutely to die for and you will love it. Let me know what you think down below. All right guys, let's talk about the pork tenderloin. As you can see, two came in my pack that I bought and I'm going to go ahead and cover them with a dry rub. This dry rub, I didn't really measure everything. I'm sorry about that guys, but it has about an eighth of a teaspoon of coriander to about one teaspoon of the onion and garlic powder. I know that, so you can get a kind of ratio there, just a little bit of coriander. And I'm going to add coriander seeds, crushed onion powder, garlic powder, thyme, and salt. And after this is done, I'm just gonna give it a nice rub all over the outside of my meat, and I'm going to put it into a pan. Now this pan, I have, I'm going to pre-warm like warm two tablespoons of olive oil in, so that when I'm ready to put that pork onto there, it just gets right to a sizzle. And I'm going to cover that with a lid and let it cook about five to six minutes on each side, making sure that I'm browning as much of the pork tenderloin as possible. Now, and while I'm doing this, I want you to preheat your oven to 400 degrees. time to prepare the asparagus. We're gonna cut and prepare our asparagus, arranging them on one side of the baking pan, drizzling it with olive oil, and stirring them to make sure that they're coated in the oil. After this, I just kinda of sprinkle them with garlic salt and a handful of Parmesan. I put them into the oven while the pork is cooking, and then after my pork has been browned on all sides, I'm gonna pull that asparagus out, put my pork on the other side of the pan, and let it cook until it's at an internal temperature of at least 145 degrees. While that's in the oven, let's return to that pan we were just cooking in to make our sauce. We're gonna add about two tablespoons of olive oil and one more finely diced shallot, as well as one teaspoon of fresh chopped rosemary and about a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half of minced garlic. And we're gonna saute those until the shallots are tender. 
After that, we are going to add one tablespoon of balsamic vinegar, as well as one tablespoon of fig jelly. And we're gonna kind of cook this into the shallot mixture, making sure to mix it really well. After about a minute or two, then we are going to add half a cup of chicken broth and add it to the sauce and let it cook until it starts to shrink down. And then we're going to turn it off and put it to the back of the stove and let it cool before we set it on top of our pork. And our dinner is ready to plate. I'm just gonna go ahead and arrange the asparagus and the risotto onto the plate. And then I am going to cut up my pork tenderloin on the side and drizzle it on top with that sauce we made. And dinner is ready. I'm telling you, you are going to absolutely love this. If you guys decide to try it, please take some pictures and let me know how you liked it and tag me on Instagram. Now it's time for my second recipe where I'm gonna show you how I make jalapeno popper chicken and cheesy herb chicken. I chose this recipe because it is incredibly versatile and you can have different flavors for different people all cooked within the same pan. I'm gonna start out by flattening all of my chicken by hitting it with my little mallet thing after I, I do like to cut it thin first. I like it to be ultra thin. And after that, I am going to get a bowl where I'm going to put crispy onions and my favorite croutons and I'm going to crush them up. You see the fork really isn't productive so I end up getting a potato masher into the mix. And once this is done, I add a little bit of cumin, some paprika, and then some breadcrumbs. And I'm going to mix this all together and set it aside. Let's talk fillings. I'm going to be making two different types. One is going to be a cheesy herb for my daughter who doesn't like a lot of spice, and the other is going to be a jalapeno popper themed for my husband and I. Now I add about a quarter of a cup of cream cheese for each chicken breast that I am going to be cooking, as well as a small handful of cheese, and that is a base for each one of these like fillings. After that, it changes up with what seasonings I put in. For my daughter, I'm adding a whole bunch of different seasonings here, including parsley, oregano, thyme, some garlic salt. Um, but basically what you really need to do is add some Italian seasoning and some garlic salt. I just didn't have it on hand. For the other, you will be adding a little bit of salt, some cayenne, paprika, uh, sorry, cumin and onion and garlic powder. After that, you are going to be putting in one teaspoon of jalapeno for each chicken breast that you are going to be filling. Okay, so now we're in our baking pan and we put a little bit of crumbs underneath each chicken breast and we're gonna put the filling over top and then roll it up and roll it into the crumbs. Afterwards, I want you to put all the extra crumbs in around the chicken breast. And this is kind of one of the tricks because it works for you in two ways. Number one, it makes a great topping for on top of your green beans or whatever vegetable or side you put on. But also it helps to keep the cheese from oozing out of all of the chicken and combining everywhere because then it kind of loses a lot of the luster. So you really wanna make sure you add these extra toppings in here. Okay, now I'm gonna be sharing one of my favorite family traditions with you. Every year I like to make an apple blackberry pie with vanilla ice cream. So I am just gonna go ahead and slice and core all of my apples and I am going to put them into a bowl with blackberries. I have a whole container that I'm going to half as well. Almost forgot those, very important. As well as a quarter cup of sugar and one teaspoon of cinnamon. Now you can add more sugar if you like. Make sure to try the apples. I don't like my pie very sweet. If you like a really sweet pie, I recommend doubling that and at least putting in half a cup of sugar. Now, I let this go ahead and sit overnight so that it kind of makes its own juices because of the sugar that I put in there. It's up to you if you want to do it the same day or not. I just like to do it the night before. Time for some more facts about Thanksgiving. So, as I was doing my research, I kind of noticed a similar theme about Thanksgiving. It would appear a couple times throughout history, our presidents have used 
Thanksgiving itself to kind of bring people together and use it as a tool for unifying the people. And I thought that that was really interesting. For instance, it was first recognized by George Washington himself back in the founding days of our country on October 3rd, 1789. And, but that, at that point, it used to be set up differently. It depended what state you were in as to when you celebrated. But 74 years later, to the day, it was first recognized and brought to a national standard by Abraham Lincoln right in the middle of the Civil War. But it wasn't actually an official federal holiday until December 26, 1941. We all know about the tragedies of Pearl Harbor, and I can totally understand why Franklin D. Roosevelt would want to bring the people together and unify them at that time. I don't know. I just thought this was a really interesting fact. Let me know what you think down below. As you can see, it's the next day and I'm putting together my pie. One thing that I did not do here that I would recommend for you is to pre-cook the base of your pie for about five to 10 minutes until you start to notice it start to bubble in your oven at 350 degrees. Um, I felt like my pie crust was just a little bit softer than I would have liked on the bottom. It is ab not absolutely necessary, just a tip. Other than that, I'm just going to go ahead and put this together and cook it at 350 degrees until my pie crust is starting to brown. I hope that you really enjoy this recipe. Sit here with me by the fire And let it go for a little while So be here as the night Starts falling, let my fingers walk over your head. We got nothing to be scared of. I'd rather be with you than by myself. Now, always in your head. Alright guys, this is going to be the end, but before we go, I wanted to give you a sneak peek to an upcoming giveaway that I'm going to be giving. The people on this channel have just been so wonderful and supported me in so many ways, and I've made so many fantastic friends that I wanted to have a way to give back. And I like to do the art of pyrography, which is where you wood burn onto different like things, and you do art with burning it in. And so basically, this is a spoon that I handmade, and I'm going to be giving it away as a free gift in my upcoming Christmas decor episode that should be airing this weekend. I hope that you guys will check out that episode and enter that day. I'll leave more details in that episode, but I hope that you really like this item. It was made from the heart. By the way, this is totally usable for cooking. All you need to do is to cover it with your favorite cooking oil and it will help to preserve the images so that you can have just a really unique cooking utensil.